Right now, though, we're going to talk to Sir Simon May, Mayo KBE, former British Army officer, uh, because uh, we need to talk to him about what's going on uh, between Russia and Ukraine. We saw footage, did we not, um, uh, early this morning of the drone strike, which supposedly uh, was planned over the Kremlin. Many people now suggesting that, in fact, uh, the most likely place where that emanated from was actually uh, not very far from the Kremlin itself, and it was probably a sort of a Russian... Um, a dark art job, shall we say. Uh, and there's been some retaliatory strikes in Kiev. Explosions heard there after Russia threatened that they would respond uh, in a very tough way. We've also had Volodymyr Zelensky at The Hague talking this morning about justice for Ukraine, talking as well about the fact that uh, Vladimir Putin has been running war criminals and war crimes in Ukraine over the past several months. But let's talk to Sir Simon, uh, find out what's going on. Simon, a very good morning to you. Hi, hi, Mike. Very thanks nice for, to see you yeah, thanks very much for joining us. I mean, I think there's a sort of universal agreement now that the uh, whatever that drone um, was that was hovering around <laughs> around the Kremlin uh, was probably not actually uh, fired from anywhere near Ukraine, and certainly probably was not controlled from anybody uh, in Ukraine. Uh, more than likely, it was a, a false flag operation. Uh, I, I think that appears to be the the, the general consensus, Mike. Um, you know, the Russians have have form on this. Uh, on, on the one hand, it, it rather reveals a sort of rather humiliating uh, defensive lapse if, if you know, you were to accept the Russian, mm. uh, the Russian narrative. But on the other hand, you know, we've got to be conscious the, the Kremlin and Putin are going to have the, the great victory parade on Tuesday, uh, you know, that annual parade in Red Square. Yes. And there's a feeling that, you know, Putin is, is, is softening his people up for another mobilization or... A distraction from um, you know the, the the chaotic scenes that we see with Russian military capability in Ukraine. Yeah, absolutely. So context is important. Yeah, context is always important. I mean, one of the things that I was reading over the weekend, Colonel Richard Kemp, amongst those uh, authoring pieces in the papers, was that uh, Ukraine might not be doing as well in this war as we've been led to believe, and suggestions that perhaps the, the new offensive will have to be successful. Um, uh, otherwise, we don't really know what might happen. Well, I, th I think that's a very fair assessment. Um, it's not a one-shot, this, but it's a very important uh, offensive when the Ukrainians do uh, embark on it. And it could come in all sorts of guises. Um, there'll be a lot of training and advisory support to the Ukrainians. But to keep Western solidarity, Western support, um, to justify, for some audiences, the commitment we've made to Ukraine uh, you know, on every level, um, the Ukrainians do need to show that they're, they're, they remain up for the fight, mm. um, you know, because the consequences of Russian actions continue to reverberate around the world. And I was reading another one of those, um, a very interesting report on what the Russians might or might not have been doing in the North Sea, mm. uh, you know, targeting or potentially targeting or setting the conditions to target some of these really important communications and, and energy pipelines we have you know crisscrossing the uh, that that part of the world yes. yeah because we were hearing uh, just a few weeks ago weren't we that there was a danger and certainly the norwegians are worried uh, about their national security in the sea because of what happened with the Nord Stream uh, pipeline as well yes well well and all the offshore wind farms which you know in due course are, are due to supply i i understand 300 million people or you name it across europe um, so huge advances, that technologically fantastic, but huge vulnerabilities inevitably. And um, I think uh, you know NATO planners and national governments will be really focusing on this. So again, the context is is much bigger than just Ukraine, um, even though we're focusing on that and and the the drone strike uh, yesterday or last night. Yeah, absolutely. And as far as the um, the general sort of principles are going, uh, because we've sort of taken our eye off, off, off Kiev and off, off Ukraine really in recent weeks, I suppose, for a number of reasons, um, militarily, what's the situation? Because we were hearing that as the weather would improve, uh, there was going to be a, um, a Ukraine-inspired sort of fight back to take back parts of the eastern Ukraine that Russia had, had sort of got its hands on. Is that still, are we still waiting for that to happen? Uh, yes, and I, and I think we need to. And as I say, Zelensky and the Ukrainians do want to show that the support they're getting from the West, they might say it's a little bit less than they'd have wanted, it, it, is justified. Um, it's good weather for offensives, um, but equally the Russians have had time to, to dig in. And at the end of the day, it's going to take either a collapse of the Russians or some collapse in the Kremlin mm. for, for the Russians to probably leave um, uh, to leave the Donbass. Yes. Um, and you need a sort of three to one advantage. So wherever the 
uh, the, wherever the Ukraine is attacked, they will need to build up a, a sort of force ratio there that will allow them to give some significant breakthrough that is more than just a tactical success, has mm. some strategic operational um, implications for the Russians and their and, and I suppose Russian public support for the continuing war. Yes, and I mean, do you see any way by which, if that was to happen, if there were to be an offensive that was successful from Ukraine's perspective, that Russia would just walk away? Because my fear would be that they would come back at some point. Yeah, I, I think you're right, Mike. I, I, I don't think we should underestimate how much skin in the game Putin has, you know, his supporters. But equally, the Russians, they're very, very proud people. They've, mm. uh, you know, historically put up with the most extraordinary amount of hardship. Uh, and they will feel very strongly uh, that the, you know, their armed forces are being humiliated and Russia's being humiliated. So we shouldn't underestimate the capacity for Putin and, you know, this if we accept it, maybe a false flag operation goes towards building mm. Putin's narrative that Russia's under attack, the West are ganging up, another sense of we mustn't be humiliated. So, um, but interestingly, you know, historically, we have seen armies collapse because soldiers are not prepared to fight and die for the cause that they thought yes. they were going through. And Wagner Group are, you know, taking huge casualties. I think there's a lot of splits within the within the command chain. I think the commanders are probably pretty disillusioned. And I think many of the conscripts who've been mobilised um, are, are are not entirely convinced mm. about the cause when they're faced with the reality of combat. No, quite. Let's switch to the matters closer to home. Um, a fabulous uh, read this morning in The Sun about uh, HMS Diamond, which is the new King's Shield, as it's being called in the newspaper. Um, basically, it's a, it's the a sort of latest in the high-tech world of war. Um, but it also doubles as a sort of party boat, so so that's all good. So if you're not firing any Sea Viper missiles or Sea <laughs> Scepter missiles, you can have a couple of glasses of uh, champagne on there. Well, they always have done, Mike. You know, th this is a bit of sovereign British territory. <laughs> you sail around the world, you know, you can put ministers on it, ambassadors can host counterparts. Um, when I was the Defence Senior Advisor in Middle East, I was all for very aggressively using our naval assets as a sort of soft, soft power tool. It's yeah. very traditional, but it is a highly capable vessel. It's specifically an anti-aircraft defence system, so it's part of the layered defence uh, for His Majesty's coronation. Um, uh, you know, well, I love the fact that it's parked in the Thames, and it will be probably <laughs> being used for hospitality purposes. But at the same time, um, it can fire its radar range goes around the curvature of the Earth. Um, it can detect and track a thousand stealth targets the size of a cricket ball. I mean, it's remarkable. It is a remarkable, well, <laughs> it's a lot of taxpayer investment in there, so I hope it's <laughs> remarkable. And it's a magnificent sight just watching a diamond coming into position. Type 45, uh, Type 45 frigate, um, very much pride of the pride of the Royal Navy, one of six of its class. Uh, and uh, not only will it do a, 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 a sterling defence and security role, as you say, it's a great sight for the British public. It's a great mm. sight for visitors to London. It's uh, absolutely right that the Royal Navy, the senior service, are parading one of their um, one of their fine vessels yes. in the heart of the nation's capital. And also, I'm very much looking forward to all the military regalia and all the military precision that we're going to see over the next few days, because the military really does make this all work like clockwork, doesn't it? Well, you know, again, we we will have our security role there. We'll have our pageant role. We are His Majesty's Armed Forces. My own regiment, the first, the Queen's Dragoon Guards, will be parading. They'll be behind the household division because they are His Majesty's troops. But as the senior regiment of the line, the Welsh Cavalry, um, the colonel of the regiment, of which I was originally colonel of the regiment for a while, three officers and 24 young men, mostly from uh, mostly from Wales, mm. will, will be very proudly pr parading. And I think it'd be a magnificent display and a great reminder of our wonderful history yeah. and our very, very close links to uh, to the royal family. Absolutely. Uh, great sight, a great sight for the British people, a great sight for everybody who comes to London to view the, cor the coronation. Yes. Without being too nosy, Sir Simon, have you got any great plans for the weekend? <laughs> the, the, uh, it won't be nosy. I wish I, to an extent, I wish I was still in London. I'm going to the, uh, the wedding of my godson, uh, who is an officer in my regiment, oh, old super. regiment. Queen's Green Guards. Oh, that would be lovely. But well, I will be watching with huge interest and great pride and great loyalty. I'll, I'll have no problem making my allegiance to uh, His Majesty. Well done. So Simon Mail, KBE, brilliant. Thank you very much indeed, former British Army officer, of course, talking about the importance of the military in what we are about to see this weekend.